Gideon? Do you feel like you accomplished something? Well, I did. Do you see this man behind me? This is Clarence Earl Gideon, as portrayed by Henry Fonda. He doesn't look like the kind of person that would take a stand and change the course of American law, does he? Well, he did. Now, let's take a look. On the evening of June 3, 1961, the Bay Harbor Pool Room in Panama City, Florida was broken into and chains from the jute box and cigarette machine were stolen, along with 12 Coca-Colas, 12 cans of beer, and some wine. All the evidence pointed to one man, Mr. Clarence Earl Gideon, a poor, gambling, four-time felon with an eighth grade education. Like many other defendants of the time, Mr. Gideon was without sufficient funds to obtain counsel for his defense. And at his trial, he made one simple request. What's this? Defendant, are you ready to go to trial? Your Honor, I'm not ready for trial. Why aren't you ready? Because I do not have a lawyer. Why don't you have a lawyer? Did you not know that this case was set for trial today? Yes, sir, I know the case was set for trial today. But if you knew your case was set for trial today, why did you not secure counsel and be prepared to go to trial? Because I'm without funds to hire an attorney. Your Honor, I'm going to ask this court to appoint me counsel to represent me in this trial. Mr. Gideon, I'm sorry, but this court cannot appoint counsel to represent you in this case. Under the laws of the state of Florida, the only time the court can appoint a lawyer to represent a defendant is in a capital case. That is a case involving the death penalty. Well, the United States Supreme Court says I'm entitled to counsel. Mr. Gideon had asked for a lawyer, and his request was denied he would be forced to represent himself in the court of law. Gideon hardly stood a chance against the experienced prosecuting attorney. Mr. Gideon was found guilty of breaking and entering with intent to commit petty larceny and sentenced to the maximum of five years in Rayford Prison, Florida. Mr. Gideon, indignant over the outcome of his trial, was not prepared to sit in prison for five years knowing he was innocent, so he spent the majority of his time in the jail library reading law books. With his jailhouse knowledge of the law, he wrote a writ of habeas corpus to the Florida Supreme Court, saying that he was being illegally incarcerated, but this was denied. Next, he wrote a writ of certiorari to the United States Supreme Court that was handwritten on line jailhouse paper, saying that the Sixth Amendment ensured the right to counsel for his defense. The writ was written in form of papyrus, meaning that he had insufficient funds to cover the filing fees. The United States Supreme Court receives literally thousands of such appeals each day, but against the odds, Gideon's petition was read, and thought important enough to present to Chief Justice Earl Warren for review. Gideon's writ of certiorari was accepted to be heard by the United States Supreme Court. It was now Gideon v. Cochran, later changed to Gideon v. Wainwright when Louis L. Wainwright replaced Cochran as the Director of Division of Corrections. Gideon's case was not the first time the right to counsel had been argued in front of the Supreme Court. This issue was argued in 1932 in Powell v. Alabama, the famous Scottsboro case in which the Supreme Court ruled that the defendant should be provided with a lawyer only in a capital offense. The topic was argued again in 1938 in Johnson v. Zerbst. In this case, the Supreme Court ruled that the appointment of counsel was required for the defendant accused in all federal cases. And the most recent at the time was Betts v. Brady in 1942. In this case, the Supreme Court ruled that the defendant should only be appointed counsel if the defendant had any special circumstances, such as illiteracy or incompetence. By the time the Gideon case came along, all but five state courts had already ruled that the defendant should be provided with a lawyer if they could not afford one. The Supreme Court appointed Washington lawyer Abe Fortas to represent Gideon. And here he was in the Supreme Court of the United States with one of the leading lawyers of the United States, one of the, certainly maybe the best litigator, certainly one of the best, the best I ever heard argue a case in the Supreme Court to represent him, from nowhere to everywhere. Fortas had to decide whether he should appeal Gideon's case by attempting to find a legal flaw in his previous trial, or take a broader approach and attempt to convince the Supreme Court to overrule Betts versus Brady. After poring over court transcripts and legal documents regarding Gideon's case, Fortas concluded that the only option was to try to convince the Supreme Court to reverse the ruling it had made in 1942 with Betts versus Brady. <laughs> 
Gideon's case couldn't have come at a better time. The United States Supreme Court under Earl Warren was described as a liberal activist court, handing down many rulings to protect civil and constitutional rights of individuals. They, particularly Justice Hugo Black, who had dissented when Betts vs. Brady was decided, had been looking for an opportunity to reconsider the ruling 20 years earlier. But I think what you do find is uh, during that, that era, I, I, uh, uh, the recognition that the government's very, very powerful and that the individual citizens certainly need uh, uh, their full constitutional protections, the full gamut of those protections, our, our justice system uh, uh, responds to those needs. And I think that's what you're seeing uh, through that court. Representing the state was Mr. Bruce R. Jacob, who was only three years on the bar. In an interview with Mr. Jacob, he explained that he did not disagree with Gideon's argument, but felt that this case would change the due process dramatically, and thought the Supreme Court should be informed in all aspects of this case. On March 18, 1963, Fortas, Jacob, and the Supreme Court met, and the lawyers gave their arguments. Unless there is a judge, and unless there is a counsel for the prosecution, and unless there is a counsel for the defense. Without that, how can a civilized nation pretend that it is having a fair trial? Federalism, we feel that the states have historically always had power to, to provide rules of procedure in their own court. And I think that, that uh, any decision laying down an inflexible rule with respect to felonies or all criminal cases would would uh, change the whole concept of due process as it's been uh, set out by this court. By a unanimous decision, the court ruled that all states must provide lawyers to poor defendants in felony cases. In its decision, the high court held that the right to counsel guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment is essential to a fair trial and applies at a state level according to the Fourteenth Amendment, which guarantees due process to all American citizens. This ruling meant that the thousands of inmates that had not had a lawyer, which was 65% of Florida prisoners at the time, would either be released or retried depending on their circumstances. Gideon would have to be retried in the same courtroom by the same judge, but this time with a lawyer. After turning down the services of three different attorneys, Mr. Fred Turner of Panama City was asked to represent Gideon. Judge McCrary denied the petition submitted by Turner on behalf of his client to quash the indictment, and on August 5, 1963, Two years and a day after his original trial, he was retried. This time, the evidence that had previously been most incriminating, including the testimony of Henry Cook, the chief prosecuting witness, was easily discredited. When the jury returned with the verdict after an hour of deliberation, Gideon was found not guilty. He was a free man. Two months after the Gideon decision, Florida enacted the Public Defender Law, creating public defender slots for each of the state's 16 judicial courts. Although the Public Defender's Office ensures that all Americans have access to legal defense, it is not without flaw. Yeah, you know, the, the, the caseload is the main complaint that you hear and probably has the biggest uh, contribution to the, to the quality of uh, legal services that can be rendered. Now, obviously, if you have 10 clients, you can do a much better job for 10 than you can for 100. Gideon was also the foundation to other right to counsel cases succeeding it. This was the predicate, so it began uh, the march, if you will, towards representation in other areas. Uh, also was the foundation for the, uh, the later case that uh, mandated counsel, uh, even to misdemeanors if you're going to be incarcerated. So it, it was a foundational kind of case for the future. You don't have to be important or powerful to take a stand. This was proved by Clarence Earl Gideon, a 52-year-old, frail, poor, gambling, four-time felon with an eighth grade education. Although he was not perfect, he took a stand for what he believed to be his legal right, and as a result today, those not fortunate enough to afford counsel in the court of law are provided with one in accordance to the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. On November the 1st, 1963, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy said, if an obscure Florida convict named Clarence Earl Gideon had not sat down in his prison cell to write a letter to the Supreme Court, the vast machinery of American law would have gone on functioning undisturbed. But Gideon did write that letter, the court did look into his case, and the whole course of American legal history has been changed.